Today, I'm going to be talking to Professor Lamin Sane, a renowned world scholar on world Christianity. And I'm going to be asking him about the starting of this conference 25 uh, years ago and asking him what the study of world Christianity means for us and for our future as Christians, particularly in Africa today. The uh, Yale Edinburgh group was really formed in 1992. Um, it was concerned with the history of the missionary movement uh, and world Christianity. Um, the idea was to bring together a group of scholars uh, to reflect and have a conversation uh, on the implications for study of Christianity today um, of this long history uh, of missionary involvement and the emergence of new Christian forms of identity and association uh, beyond the West. Um, the feeling that we had, um, I met with my colleague on the walls uh, to begin this process, the feeling we had was that the uh, emergence of Christianity uh, in the 20th century um, was going to revise our picture of Christianity as a religion, no longer seen merely as a Western religion, but as a world religion. That is to say, a religion whose worldwide impact would produce uh, consequences um, that would revamp our picture of Christianity simply as a European or Western religion. And the conversations we started in 1992, we thought we might have 10 or 12 people uh, and then after two or three years, perhaps uh, we'll move on to other things. Um, but the group has grown uh, in size um, as well as in the inclusion participation of younger scholars. Um, so we're, we're grateful for that. We didn't anticipate that, but that's really what's happened. My own view of it is that the history of Christianity must be seen in terms of the claim that Christianity is entitled to its own truth claims, rather than Christianity as a function of the cultural and political ascendancy of the West, which would exclude societies in Africa and Asia and elsewhere um, that are increasingly being impacted by the Christian movement. And so changing the focus to Christianity as a world religion, we can repossess the religious core uh, of Christianity as belonging to no nation in particular, but belonging to all peoples of the world, and that the Western face of Christianity is only a stage um, along the unfolding story and history of Christianity, which may have a beginning, but really has no end. And I would say one of the most important things about world Christianity is the basic affirmation that Christianity is invested in the language and the tradition and the custom of Christians. Therefore, Christianity is not a transplant religion and the framework for encountering the gospel, Christianity, is the framework of indigenous appreciation and affirmation. This is crucial. Christianity doesn't end there, but it begins there. Um, and therefore, the study of Christianity is essentially the study of the societies and cultures in which we find it. Look at the paradox in this way. Unlike Islam, Christianity is a world religion that is unique in being centered in the language and the idioms of the peoples of the world. Christianity is unique in being a world religion that is not transmitted in the language of the founder of the religion. Christians do not worship and pray and read the scriptures in the language of Jesus and they feel there is no necessity to do so. Well, this means, therefore, that Christianity comes, if you like, pre-programmed to affirm and to 
celebrate uh, the language and the culture of the people it encounters, which means that Christianity is a religion that is best anticipated in the cultures and the idioms in which we find it. Christianity is unique in being perhaps the only world religion that is invested in the language and the idioms and the cultures that preceded it in the world. Which means, therefore, we say in Christianity that God preceded the missionary. Uh, in, in African societies, uh, missionaries came and asked for the name of God of the peoples and the languages it encounters. And these names missionaries had to learn and adopt as the God of Christianity. But this name was there before the missionaries came. It was there before Christianity arose. And therefore, it really was uh, an essential affirmation and confirmation that God was there before the missionaries came. Mm -hmm. And I think this is true for all of Christianity, wherever you find it. So what we have in common as Christians is this prior affirmation by God of who and what we are. And the amazing thing for me as a historian is the fact that Jesus has not required Christians to adopt his culture and his language in order to embrace his religion. It was as if Jesus was saying that the cultures and the languages of the world are also his. Mm. That he's there, he's in those languages and those cultures. And though Christianity is not about the Christian discovery of indigenous societies, but the indigenous discovery of Christianity, uh, that is crucial to understand, then allows us to broaden out, to affirm other believers as members of the same fellowship. We have a kinship of faith that transcends culture, but doesn't uh, reject culture, it affirms culture and reassesses it and possesses it for the glory of God. And this means therefore Christianity has an inbuilt uh, remedy for chauvinistic nationalism, for tribalism, for racism, and all other forms of cultural exclusion that infringe on God's capacity to embrace and to welcome all peoples of the world within the family of God. Now, this is why I say that the Christian part of the African part of the Christian story is not apart from Christianity, but belongs to the stream of Christianity. And I hope that African scholars, Christian scholars, in all disciplines, will awaken to this wonderful opportunity we have to if you like, reimagine, reconceptualize the human family in terms that recognize the African voice and the African face. Because peoples of the world will benefit from this enrichment of understanding of the Christian family as one based in faith, not in blood or race. Uh, and we take an example of, from Jesus himself, who divested himself of his own culture in order to make room and space for us, uh, to welcome us. Uh, Paul struggled to bring Jew and Gentile to the same table to participate in the fellowship. Uh, it was a struggle for him. He was prepared to risk his life. I think today we see the fulfillment, if you like, of that unspoken Pauline prayer that Jew and Gentile will come together in the family of God. And Africa, in my view, is a great fulfillment uh, of that silent, unspoken prayer. Mm. One of the things that excites me about the field is almost everywhere where there is serious scholarship in Christianity, almost everywhere, I would say in the West, in Europe and North America, professors in those departments have become aware of 
Christianity in Asia and Africa in a way that they were not before. So many of Cloud World scholars say to me how grateful they are that they now have a voice recognized, which was not the case before, at least not on this scale. That really excites me. Uh, the idea that we can expand our circle of uh, acquaintance, our circle of knowledge to include people beyond the West. And that's very exciting. The other thing that excites me is that for the first time, many universities and seminaries in North America, for example, have positions created in the field of world Christianity where they are appointing Asian and African scholars. Uh, that's very, very gratifying. Um, and there are journals now that publish in the field um, and they publish scholarship by African and Asian scholars. Um, I think that <clears throat> enlarging the bounds of uh, Christian knowledge, uh, participation, production of scholarship, uh, institutional commitment to world Christianity uh, means that there's great scope and in the end, I hope that a partnership develops um, where the resources of the West can help to build and strengthen and back uh, developments and initiatives in Africa, but where also the momentum of Christianity in Africa and serious uh, engagement with uh, intercultural um, and interpersonal uh, encounters can be really reflected in the West so that theology doesn't become a ghetto discipline um, and that it has a public face and public resonance. And I think Christians in Asia and Africa can bring this perspective to bear on Christians in the West. Mm. Yeah, um, of course, Andrew Walls uh, said that he knew me. Um, I don't remember <coughs> when I was in high school <laughs> already. But in 1981, uh, I was approached by Andrew Walls um, and asked me if I would be interested in applying for a position at the University of Baden in the Department of Religious Studies. Uh, and when I arrived in Aberdeen, Andrew was then uh, head of department, and our association began there. But it also led to, to really the field of world Christianity, because when I was um, recruited by the University of Aberdeen, I was recruited as a specialist in Islamic studies. So my teaching at Aberdeen was in Islamic studies, uh, general introduction to Islamic theology, uh, history of Islam, and a little bit in history of Islam in Africa. And then one year, Andrew asked me to teach a course in African Christianity, and I protested that <laughs> that was not why the university hired me, but he persisted. And when I started doing uh, readings in the field, I was struck by the fact that unlike Islam in Africa, um, missionaries in African Christianity began with the question to Africans, what name do you call God? Um, uh, Muslim missionaries are not interested in that question. What name people in Africa call God is not relevant because it is not a theologically valid question. There is no God in Islam that precedes Islam. Islam comes with, with God with Allah. It's not translated from an African word or whatever. So this really struck me as a student of Islam that this is an amazing theological wow. assumption to make that Africans knew God and their name for God is valid and thirdly that name for God must be adopted as the God of Christianity. And that really, for me, opened my eyes to what a tremendous religious revolution Christianity was. And so I spent two years asking if there are scholars in African Christianity or in Christianity in general who have picked up on this theme and are thinking about it and writing about it. And I was told, no, I was flabbergasted. 
Then I went to Harvard uh, University Divinity School. And I asked my colleagues, professors in New Testament, Old Testament, ethics, professors in comparative religion, um, I said my question was very sharp because I had to ask a very clear question. I said, is it true that Christianity as a world religion is conveyed and transmitted without the language of the founder of the religion? They all said to me, yes. I said, well, is that not significant for the relationship between Christianity and culture? And they said, yes, it's obvious once you ask the question. And my Harvard colleague said to me, why do we not ask it? Why do we not ask this question, which is so fundamental to Christianity? That is really what launched uh, my career in world Christianity, and uh, Andrew and I co corresponded, we collaborated, I wrote essays, I wrote papers, and I did uh, chapters of my book translating the message as a faculty seminar at Harvard, and got great encouragement and support from my colleagues there, in all fields, in all fields. Um, and that was what emboldened me to write the book translating the message. <laughs> I was at Lambeth Conference one year, and Bishop MacDonald, who is a bishop in Alaska, uh, saw my name tag at Lambeth and stopped and uh, grabbed me by the hand. He said, so you are Lam and Sane? I said, yes. Yeah. My people know you. My people. I said, who are your people? He said, the Eskimos of Alaska. I said, how, how would they know you? Oh, he said. We read your book, and they are really uh, amazed by discovering from your book that the language they speak is language that is acceptable to God also. So the fact that they said, so God speaks our language, and that means we are a people who count in the eyes of God. Why didn't missionaries tell us that before? Mm -hmm. Are there places where people have, have read your book and you are surprised? Yes. <laughs> yes. Other uh, places. <laughs> very many, many places. I get uh, communication from uh, Iceland uh, about my book. I get uh, uh, letters, uh, emails from Russia. Mm. Um, I have correspondence with people in Norway. Mm. Um, I have even people in India, in Indonesia. Uh, I even have Muslim friends who write to me from, from around the world. And what I say about Islam, they like, they, they, they think it's, it's trustworthy. Um, and what I also say about Christianity is true, that Christianity is invested in all the languages of the world, that God owns all these languages and speaks through them. Um, it tends to fragment and divide Christians, but it should really draw us together to recognize that our languages are vehicles um, and instruments in the hand of God uh, to create a fellowship uh, where our differences are accepted to enrich our diversity as the people of God. So I do get um, uh, a remarkable uh, responses from people all over the world. I was in Kenya, Nairobi once, and I was walking through a theological seminary, a Nairobi Graduate School of Theology, and the students um, surrounded me. I uh, said, we've been reading your book, and they want to take photographs with me, uh, all because they say, you've given us a voice uh, that yes. we didn't think we had. Because, uh, that's very gratifying, but for me, I tell you, the most gratifying thing is when people express to me how they experience the generosity of God uh, in terms of their language, their culture. That this is not just a theory, but it's a fact. That really moves me because I think then I see that God can reveal himself to us in all his fullness without having to be filtered through German or French or Spanish or so forth and so on. You see what I mean? 
that when God comes to us uh, in our own language, uh, this is as true and authentic uh, as in any other language, uh, whether it's Latin or Greek or French or German. And if Africans believe this, I think they can be more confident about their Christianity. That's really what motivates me in my work.